Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, so looking forward to uh, <laughs> so uh, looking forward to this one. So let's start off with this question. So it, it seems like you know if you were to guess maybe 20 years ago, you would have never thought of you know uh, Wall Street and Madison Avenue as being similar, but increasingly, both on a, on a technology side, but also even thinking about advertising as a commodity, they're they're becoming close and closer together. Um, so uh, I wanted to, just to start things off, to get some context, if you guys want to start off and just give us a quick synopsis of each company. Uh, uh, Louis, if you want to start, and just talk sure. a little bit about Nyax. Uh, Nyax is a guaranteed contract advertising exchange. We're built off of NASDAQ's financial framework. Uh, what we do is we match advertiser and agencies to publishers according to demographics, geographics, and the content within the contracts, the, I, the IOs, the RFPs, the RFIs. Publishers can also upload all of their sales inventory, and we're taking a process of the direct campaigns that they do today from a manual process to an automated exchange. And Joe? Yeah, thanks. Um, so MediaMath, uh, leading independent programmatic marketing platform, so basically integrate uh, all digital media touch points, uh, layer it with data, and bring the math part, the AI machine learning to bear. Given the context, maybe my favorite metaphor, uh, Bloomberg terminal for marketing, basically the uh, operating system for the marketing professional. Great. Cool. So um, I want to jump back to Louis for a quick second here, because uh, Niax is still pretty new. Um, and I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about one of the interesting things here is uh, it's kind of spun out from NASDAQ in a way, like in terms of using financial technology and applying that into a new advertising network. So uh, just for a little more, if you could talk a little bit about how did you guys do that? Like how, so, because programmatic advertising is no longer new. Like, you know, like automated advertising has been around for 10, 15 years now um, in, in varying degrees. But like, how did you guys decide to create you know, uh, the company, and what did you take from NASDAQ and, and apply into that? So, a uh, lot of questions, I'll answer the yeah. first one. <laughs> so our two co-founders, uh, Mark Grimbaum and Carolina Avenanti, uh, thought of this concept about three and a half, four years ago, uh, but they didn't have an engine or a platform to put it on. So they went to uh, Dow Jones and a couple other people first, and uh, the ch our chairman of the board, uh, Tom O'Neill, who sat on NASDAQ's board for 12 years, and uh, someone that I've known in that, the industry for the past almost 25 years uh, said, let's put it on NASDAQ. And went to Adina Friedman at the time, who was the president and COO, and who's the CEO now as of January. And she loved the idea and the concept to take a financial technology platform that's transparent, open, completely automated, with probably the purest, most regulated matching engine in the industry, and bring it into other industries and other verticals. And what better than the ad tech space? It's, we're a little bit dysfunctional, some fragmented. Uh, we have manual processes on top of automated processes, and it's, it's just a big mess at some times, and especially in the direct world, not in the programmatic world. In the direct world, when they're sending off IOs from agencies to the publishers, it's a manual process of Excel spreadsheets, PDFs, uh, large documents, and we're taking the asset classes of what a financial rigors or financial framework can do and putting it into advertising. We built all the different instruments and asset classes that we had to according to advertising and according to the way our market works and we put it into the platform. So we layer that, our UI, on top of what's known as NASDAQ's OMEX platform, their financial framework. It's, uh, it's in 50 countries and they power 82 exchanges across the world. Cool. So, so Joe, so I'm, I'm kind of curious. So, Media Math has been around for how many years now again? Ten years. Ten years. So, and it seems like over the last year or two, uh, programmatic advertising has become more, I guess, more popular in, in kind of the, the general framework of not just with advertisers, but even starting to creep into, you know, users are starting to understand it more and how data is processed and how, how, that, how it's collected to target ads. But what was it, what was the, um, is there a certain inflection point where, uh, programmatic advertising became more adopted rather than it being some sort of experimental um, ad exchange? Gosh, well, thank you for saying that because it's only been 20 years of work. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, great. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to hear that, that's, uh, that we've reached mainstream. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah look, I think uh, confluence of a number of factors. Uh, you know, one, I think digital now surpassing you know, half of every you know, marketing dollar invested uh, one. Two, like to great extent, this is just uh, paying off the promise of uh, a lot of things that digital has been talking about in terms of you know truly automating the experience and providing an omni-channel 
consistent experience to end consumers. Uh, I think you know marketers have always had that as uh, an end goal. Uh, but to some of the fragmentation that, you know, Lou, you, you talked about, uh, it's been very, very challenging to do that in real life, right? You've worked with multiple media companies, you've had every different format was uh, different, what, whether you're doing display or you're doing video, you were doing mobile, you're doing social, every one of those um, underlying uh, sort of media types or channels kind of required its own bespoke set of processes, they often had their own metrics and what have you. And basically the work over the past decade has been kind of plugging away and stitching all those things together into a software layer, kind of instrumenting all of that, such that you can kind of get back to what marketers have always assumed, or you know, people outside of marketing have always assumed was how it worked, where you pushed a button and a bunch of these screens changed in, in sort of real time. And I think where we've gotten to now is uh, the reality has sort of caught up to a lot of the, you know, the, the promises, or as I put it, the kinetic energy has matched the potential energy. And now people are sort of seeing it in real life. And then anytime you, you cross the halfway mark of things, I think that in and of itself is uh, important. So, uh, you know, programmatic now north of half of every digital dollar being invested. Uh, people are now normalized it. It's become sort of, you know, mainstream. Uh, and now I think it was where the fun starts. Uh, now I think it's where you know people kind of uh, the technology is sort of there. Uh, now it's about the work in you know business process. It's about the work in uh, you know creating these lighthouses, uh, these sort of advanced you know using the advanced capabilities to actually you know move the needle in the in the marketing organization. So yeah, and I think we're there. I think the last 18 months we've seen a massive um, uptick in the sophistication of how people are thinking about programmatic, kind of moving it from. Uh, something that's sort of been on the side to the, you know, how they did everything else, uh, to really basically saying, no, 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 this is the way that I want to manage all of my customer relationships. This is where I'm going to put my first, second, and third party data. I want to eventually start connecting the dots between paid, which is still you know, a bulk of the marketing budget, but connected to earned and owned. Uh, and suddenly, like, uh, now that you've got all the screens connected, to have uh, stateful, persistent conversations with human beings across touch points, across time, we're there mm -hmm. right now, and it's super exciting. Yeah, so, so I'm kind of curious, I know there's a lot of potential with uh, you know, targeting people with the right uh, ads and whatnot, but there's also the question of uh, the, the commodification of these digital ads and, and, and how uh, you know, pricing happens and it seems like sometimes <laughs> you know, certain types of ads are getting cheaper and cheaper. And so I was wondering if you guys could talk about that a little bit. Like how, because there are what, like 6,000, aren't there like 6,000 advertising technology companies in the ecosystem at this point? Like, am I right? Is it? I want to take this one absolutely, but Lou, I'm going to leave it to you first because I tend to wax on for a little while. So, <laughs> so um, <laughs> if I could answer it in, in yeah. terms of what, what we're doing, yeah. um, we're basically trying to put the power back into the advertiser and the publisher's hands, along with building trust and transparency by utilizing the blockchain. Our platform uh, has started on the blockchain and it, it's an immutable core ledger that's going to be able to make sure that every transaction, every record, and every ad is flowed through there that can't be changed where there's going to be a lot of authentication. The trust and transparency is what advertisers and publishers are looking for. And I think with, like you said, all these technology companies out there, programmatic taxes come into play. Uh, the black box of the RTB world. Um, GDPR is now something that's happening here in the EU coming in 2018 and it's still a concept and something that will eventually happen in the United States where Joe and I and you are from. But I think that trust, transparency, less fraud, uh, and better people-based marketing is, is what's going to happen. And I think a lot of the companies, like you said, all those technology companies in the online advertising space will go away if they don't adopt. And they're going to have to adopt this. There's company like... Joe's company just did ad.txt and, and with all of his publishers, which is phenomenal. It's the way that, that we have to do to cut fraud and be able to be more transparent and open and drive a better ROI because we're going to lose the brands in the digital world if we don't. So I'm glad I let that happen because I'm going to disagree with you both, um, or at least the underlying assumption or the premise underneath that, which is um, there is this... Uh, I'm going to call it fundamental misconception, but that you know it's the same dollar that flows through the ecosystem, and that uh, you know sort of everybody that touches it is uh, somehow a quote tax. Um, haven't necessarily articulated this in um, in this way before, but you know it's a little bit like uh, there's you know buying a cow and there's a meal in the best restaurant you've ever been to, and there's a bunch of value add that happens between the first experience and the and the second one. 
uh, given the number of things that are actually necessary to uh, make all this stuff happen in real life across a constellation of you know, media companies, technology companies, and data companies, uh, there is a lot of value to be added in the, you know, the fundamental transformation of a raw asset of a little bit of somebody's time and attention into business results for a brand. And we should be comfortable with that. I think the, um, you know, the diversity of uh, digital marketing and the number of people that are involved is actually a sign of strength and not a sign of weakness. If and only if you can uh, clearly align around a set of outcomes that all parties agree with. And I'm, I'm going to go all the way to both ends of the spectrum marketers and brands on one side and the end human being the end consumer on the other one that needs to get the you know needs to get value out of all of this stuff uh, with incremental outcomes being created for both of those poles uh, it actually creates a huge amount of value for everybody sort of in between uh, who are uh, adding value to that recipe uh, in order to make that sort of alchemy happen so I'm actually a um, you know we're in a position to uh, um, you know, to effectively sort of kind of do it all. And uh, we are an incredibly partner philic organization in the sense that there is so much innovation that's happening in the real world today. You know, we think about the media landscape as relatively fixed, I think. But if you think about the amount of innovation that is still to come, and I don't just mean sort of the Snapchats and the Pinterests and how Twitter is going to, you know, evolve, but, you know, new emerging AR, VR, where truly you've got digital out of home, you truly have programmatic audio at scale. Uh, there are things that we haven't even imagined yet as marketers that are about to come to life. And the way that you tackle that is through an ecosystem that uh, is, you know, motivated and incentivized and enabled to, you know, to do that. So I'm uh, a, quite a big proponent of, uh, you know, fragmentation is the wrong word. Fragmentation with a platform or with a, a rationalizing infrastructure, I, I think is an important way forward. Sure. So I want to talk for a second, uh, uh, you, me you mentioned this a little bit, thinking about like, like ad fraud and how a lot of people are trying to uh, tackle this more. We're seeing a lot of uh, the major advertisers that are kind of uh, doing complete audits of, of their systems and whatnot. But I'm kind of curious um, if, if you could talk about what's happening right now and you know, it's interesting thinking about measurement uh, and uh, how you have uh, these big measurement companies that are becoming more and more uh, prevalent uh, and thinking about standards, but thinking again about this intersection of, or this comparison of Wall Street and Madison Avenue, you know, I can't, I can't help but think about, um, you know, the financial crisis and the subprime mortgages and how nobody saw that coming until it was too late. And there's been a lot of questions of how much of programmatic advertising is fraudulent or maybe it's, you know, mispriced or whatnot. And I'm kind of curious, um, in the financial side, you have S&P, you have Bear, or, uh, Moody's, you get, you get Fitch, that were being paid by the people that they're supposed to measure. Is the same thing happening with, with uh, advertising now? Because you have uh, these companies that are being paid to measure. I'm kind of curious if you could talk about uh, that similarity a bit. Is it, is it wrong for me to think like that? And also, um, does measurement, uh, is it independent enough? Yeah, it is. And, and I'll go first, Joe, if you don't mind. Um, so it's a long-winded question. <laughs> yeah. You know, financial, you talked about you know, the banking industry in the United States in the late 2000s. Uh, you know, exchanges didn't play a part in that. And, you know, companies like NASDAQ and NICE and Dow Jones and all that, the, the banking fraud was basically something that wasn't caught. Yeah. It's a shame. In, in ad tech, we've realized that there's fraud. We realize that there's non-human traffic. We realize that there's bots that are masking as URLs. Um, transparency, open platforms are the ones that are gonna stop a lot of it. Do I ever think that fraud and verification companies will eliminate fraud? No. They're always, there's always going to be fraudsters that the minute we find solutions, they're going to find alternative solutions to be able to come in and take away advertising dollars. But to decrease it by, by having advertisers and publishers in a more automated, programmatic way do their transactions, and by, them, by matching exact campaigns to the publishers that can actually drive an ROI or get it to the consumer, like Joe said, I believe in marketing. I believe in the fact that you need to get your message and your word out to the people. And there's no better way to do it than in the digital landscape. Out of home digital, like Joe said, it's, it's gonna be huge. I mean, we haven't even touched where we can go with that yet. And according to GPS and where people are located and how they're located, you know, gas stations have TVs on them and you walk into places and there's television screens just about everywhere. And there's a digital screen everywhere we go. Every single person here has a smartphone. 
So if we touch those people in the right way with the right campaign and we do it in the right order of permission-based marketing, then yeah, ad, ad tech will, will succeed and go far and we will decrease fraud. I think there's something to that. I think you know, a lot of this has been, um, as it is in many things, an incentives problem. So you know, technology raced ahead, and uh, yet I think we were using sort of old metrics uh, in a lot of cases, you know, buying cheap eyeballs, uh, you know, driving uh, upstream clicks. And you know, those things are fairly easy in an automated system to get in front of and to fake effectively. Uh, which is, you know, incredibly problematic. I think uh, earlier this year with, uh, you know, Mark Pritchard, you know, quite famously, I think, uh, has been on a bit of a stump speech about the need for the supply chain in digital, given just how prominent it is, given how, uh, you know, uh, big it is today, but also how uh, meaningful and impactful it's going to be for people, marketers going forward, kind of threw down the gauntlet and said, you know, it's time for this industry to kind of mature out of a gangly adolescence into uh, at least a young adulthood. So go fix it. And where I think that starts, you know, beyond the technical, uh, you know, approaches of viewability and, you know, non-human traffic standards and what have you, those things obviously inc you know, incredibly critical, and yes, you need those. Uh, in a lot of cases, necessary but insufficient in my mind. The big change happens with uh, incentives, right? And as marketers start saying, uh, here is where I'm willing to spend my money and here are the real uh, goals that I'm trying to drive, it's not the upstream proxies, but it's the, you know, here in-store sales as an example. And um, effectively, I'm only going to pay on the things that really, really matter. The nice part of it is, you know, uh, bots tend not to buy product, right? And if they did, you'd probably be pretty happy with those robots, right? Yeah. <laughs> Going out there and buying your stuff day in and day out. Robots can quite yeah. quickly, you know, drive clicks and uh, drive, you know, uh, web behaviors effectively. As soon as we have that sort of mental reframing that says, one, we're going to start driving the right incentives. You know, two, we can start pushing and communicating those incentives downstream. So, you know, from demand through supply chain to end consumer and only going to reward those things that look like they're good behaviors. Uh, then I think you get to down to, you know, to your point, Lou, I think uh, base rate in any industry, you think about credit card fraud exists, sure, it's at, you know, 1% or lower. Uh, you know, uh, security and, uh, you know, in almost any industry in terms of a website or in terms of copy protection uh, for, you know, digital content or what have you. As long as the, you know, the level is below in the basis point uh, level, you, you, you can in fact assume that. When it's above that, it's a real problem. When you're, when you're dealing with a lemon law, when you're dealing with 5% fraud or 6% fraud in the supply chain, it really gives people a lack of confidence to sort of lean in and, and invest and make the right decisions on a long-term basis. But we're, we're there now. We're at the striking distance of single digit, you know, even you know, 1% uh, you know, fraud in the supply chain. And that should give people, I think, some comfort about where the world's going. Sure, and so we don't have much time left, but I, I wanted to ask one last quick kind of light, lightning round question. Uh, thinking about, um, consumer privacy and, and, and consumer information, I, I think the average user doesn't realize how these ads track them. And, and I guess we're, we're seeing that a bit more um, at the forefront these days, trying to educate people. But I'm kind of curious, you know, are we at the point where um, you know, database marketing, um, programmatic advertising, should it be regulated at this point? Uh, I agree. I, I, think, I think it should be. I think that uh, brands can spend their, their dollars better when they're actually getting to somebody that wants to see their ads. Opting in and opting out, I think, is a people's rights. It's it's permission-based marketing, and and you know they just serve and slam the, the ad in there. It's 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 going away because, like Mark Pritchard said, as as Joe mentioned, there's millions and millions of dollars being wasted by by ads that aren't relevant or getting to the right consumer. You know, marketers today are getting much more savvy, and they want to be able to connect with the people that want to buy their products and want to see their ads and want to see their offers. And I'm a big proponent of uh, super strong, globally consistent, extraordinarily transparent, uh, highest common denominator, uh, you know, standards. Uh, presumably self-reg because I do actually think that on a market by market basis, a country by country basis, uh, the, the world is not moving in uh, a consistent direction. And so, you know, we as an industry, just thinking about the long term and thinking about the sort of customer promise in the long run, uh, need to hold ourselves to an incredibly high standard. And it's, it's actually an easy, it's not even a trade-off, right? It is an easy thing to say yes to. Uh, because the number of things that we need to do as, you know, programmatic, as digital media, as, you know, pick your descriptor for the activities that presumably most of the people here in this room are, you know, are involved in, 
uh, paying off the customer promise on one hand and really driving like deep attribution on the marketer side to pay off the promise of digital from a marketer's perspective. Those things, there's so much work to do there that the gotcha. need to go and push further into privacy or into you know, more data use or what have you, like you don't have to do that for 20 years. There's a, so much work to be done between now and, and there uh, that I think it's very, very easy for people to say, let's hold ourselves up to an extraordinarily high bar because it's the right thing to do. Awesome, well thanks, that's all the time we have. Uh, thanks to you thanks, both Ryan. and thanks to everybody. Enjoy, Joe. Thank you.